All right, everybody. A uh, few week break on our Bible study, but now we're going to take back off. Uh, back in Genesis. Um, this week we'll be focusing on Genesis 37. Uh, I'm going to give us a little bit of a lead up into that. But first, I'd like to open us with prayer. So, dear gracious Heavenly Father, just thank you for your grace and your mercy on us, Lord. Uh, just giving us the opportunity, Lord, through your word to grow and learn and just become more like you in all that we do, Lord. Thank you for the opportunities you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the technology, Lord, that you've given us that allows us to do this. Even though we can't be present here together, Lord, that we just, we can still put this out there and it can be ministered, Lord. Lord, be with us as we go through this. Open our hearts, open our minds, Lord. Speak through me and just let your name be praised in all that we do. So we name we pray. Amen. So, um, we... Our last week that we were in here, we did Genesis 36. Um, I'm going to give us a little bit of lead up, though, of some past chapters, just in case you may have forgot the previous weeks. So, um, I'm going to jump back to Genesis 34. Uh, Genesis 34, what we looked at, uh, Dinah, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, is raped by Shechem, who is consumed with his lust. Uh, we see Hamar, Shechem's dad, tries to arrange a marriage with the people, groups, for financial reasons with Jacob. We also see in chapter 34 that Jacob's sons make a deal deceitfully, sort of like what Jacob used to do, because they are ate up with murderous lust. We also see in chapter 34, Jacob is worried about the other countries attacking him. His trust of God is still concerning so that leads us into Genesis 35, where Genesis 35, we see where God told Jacob to go to Bethel and make an altar. So Jacob calls for all foreign gods to be given up. Uh, everybody around him, they do, and they all travel and go to Bethel. God protects Jacob and his sons by putting fear in the hearts of the people of cities around him. Um, instills them with fear so that way he can have safe passage through them. Again, God taking care of Jacob. God renames him Israel. Jacob must have forgotten from chapter 32 that he was already renamed by God there to be Israel. Uh, but he's renamed Israel, and God promises to be fruitful and multiply, having a king come from him. So Rachel dies in labor when Benjamin is born. Reuben sleeps with Bilhah, Israel's concubine, and Isaac dies at 180 years old. Genesis 36, uh, that was the last chapter that we did where we talked about uh, genealogy, but we also saw in this chapter, we saw Esau moving to the hill country of Seir and becoming the Edomites. We look at the genealogy of Esau, how he married descendants of Ishmael, the Canaanites. We were reminded that God's promise was with Jacob not with Esau. But we're also reminded how God keeps his promises in that chapter. Um, if you remember all of the names, all of the people we were trying to pronounce and trying to get through, basically one of the things we need to remember from this is this is a reminder of how he kept his promise to Abraham that his seed would be as the sand of the seashore even through Ishmael. And how he told Rebekah that she would birth two nations. Uh, we also saw in this chapter that God's character revealed to us in the genealogy chapters. We see, we learn a little bit more about our God when we look at these things because it is proof of God keeping his promises. You know, we often overlook those chapters, but we need to recognize them as proof of kept promises by our Lord. So, that leads us right up to chapter 37. So if you want to flip to 37, and I will read through this. Chapter 37, Genesis 37. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. 
But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, So you think you will be our king? Do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream. He said, the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked, when your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow on the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the Valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for, he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father, a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmael-like traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said, Judah said to his brothers, what would we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crowd. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmael-like traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, The boy is gone! What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message, Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. 
His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son. He would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt, where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. So, we see Joseph coming into the story here. First, let me, uh, let me give you a little bit of history on Joseph, on his heritage. <clears throat> so, um, Joseph was born of Jacob's old age, of Rebekah, whom Jacob loved. If you remember, he really loved Rebekah, and she's the one that had Joseph. In this reading, Joseph's character is comparative to the life of Jesus and is often recognized as mirroring Jesus' sacrifice. And as we get a little bit farther into his character and into his study, we're going to see parts of Joseph's life where there was humiliation, but then there was praise and adoration to him. And we're going to kind of see a little bit of that as we look at his life. And, and that kind of mirrors what we see happening in Jesus. So when we look at certain character themes um, in the Old Testament narratives, we can look at other characters and how Joseph plays into them. Um, when you look at Enoch, somebody like Enoch showed the walk of faith. Noah showed the perseverance of faith. Abraham showed the obedience of faith. Isaac showed the power of faith. Jacob shows the discipline of faith. With Joseph, we could say he shows the triumph of faith. So, in this, where we're at in this chapter, basically we're seeing Joseph. He's a 17-year-old boy when we catch up to him. Anybody knows, if you've been around teenagers, sometimes some of the way they express things don't come across real great. So, Joseph is 17 and we're going to see how some of his attitude might have played into a little bit of this. But before we do, one writer spoke about uh, his quote on Joseph was that he was loved and hated, favored and abused, tempted and trusted, exalted and abased. Yet at no point in the 110 year life of Joseph did he ever seem to get his eyes off God or cease to trust him. Adversity did not harden his character. Prosperity did not ruin him. He was the same in private as in public. He was truly a great man. And as we dig deeper into his character in future chapters, you're going to see more of that play out. But we've got him in the first part. We've got him here in his teenage years. Um, and as we're learning more about him, we see that, okay, Jacob loves Joseph more than the others. And they knew that. Um, Jacob obviously showed this love to his family, and the other brothers were well aware of it. And I'm sure that was, uh, that was a stinging factor for them in this. Jacob even went as far as he made a coat of collars. Um, some people say, you know, some of the different commentaries will will say that it was a coat of different colors, but then some of them will say, well, this was a coat that had long sleeves on it, and most coats during that time did not have long sleeves on it, so that's what made it unique in its fashion. But anyway, he's got the coat of collars, and I'm sure he's very proud of it as a young teenage boy out here with his father's favor, showing it to everybody. But Jacob had Joseph tending the sheep, had him acting like a shepherd. Um, even with Jacob favoring Joseph, he was still teaching his son a, a work ethic. Um, you know, some people will question, if you're not willing to teach your children a work ethic, um, how much are you loving them when you spoil them? So I think it's important that you recognize that also. He, he's teaching Joseph uh, habits of work in that, as he's got him out there helping with the sheep as well. But he, Joseph tells on the sons of Bilhah and Zippah for doing something that they should not have been doing. So he's basically going and he's ratting out the other brothers um, when they're not doing everything that they should be doing. 
And of course, as you can imagine, they don't like that too well. Uh, this angers them that much more. That here is this little 17 year old boy and he's ratting us out in everything we do. Dad already loves him more than me, more than us. Oh my gosh, he's driving us crazy. So we see that happen. So we get to the dreams. We're up to about verse 5 now. And in the first dream, um, we hear him describing bundles of grain, sheaves or bundles of grain. Now, that may be a little bit hard for us to think about here because we don't see a lot of bundles of grain as we drive around our area. But if you kind of think, it's almost like they call them the fodder shocks that everybody puts out at Thanksgiving and Halloween, the big bundles of corn stalks, how they tie them up and everybody puts them out in front of their house for decoration. That's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about large bundles of grain um, that were tied up. So he's describing this dream and all the brothers' bundles bow down to Joseph's bundle. Um, we will find out later, this is prophetic, and that Joseph can interpret dreams. This is just a little taste of these dreams that, that he's having that he's telling other people about. Obviously, as you can imagine, the brothers do not like this. Uh, they become angry, um, and they basically tell him, stuff it, Joseph. We're not, what makes you think we're going to bow to you? You're 17 years old. We know your daddy's favorite, but we're not bowing to you for anything. So... Obviously, it anchors them a little bit. And that may be where you see a little bit of Joseph's youth coming out, telling already brothers that can't stand him that they're going to be bowing to him. So, now he begins to describe the second dream. And in this second dream, he talks about the sun, moon, and 11 stars bow down to Joseph. Now, he tells it to the brothers, and he tells it to Jacob. Obviously, when he tells it to Jacob, Jacob knows this isn't going to go over well with the brothers. Uh, and Jacob kind of scolds him, um, kind of along the lines of, what, so if I'm going to bow to you also, me and your mom? You know, and, and I would imagine that would kind of sound like a parent scolding a smart aleck young teen who's saying things that uh, is, is getting people's emotions worked up. So, <clears throat> Jacob kind of addresses that with him, but Jacob remembers this dream, and he thinks, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ponder on this a little bit. Hmm, I wonder what this dream means. So, of course, the brothers, they become very jealous. They become very angry. Uh, these dreams obviously do not help their anger or their jealousy of their already beloved brother, and we begin to see a lead up to some of their motives here in the future. Um, we begin to see a build up for this motive. And what we begin to see in this is we begin to see in the brothers the devil taking a foothold through their anger and their pride and their jealousy. Um, the devil has got a foothold in there. And that's a good thing for us to examine in our own lives. Do we struggle with pride and jealousy? Um, do we relate more to the brothers in this section of Scripture? Or do we relate to Joseph? Because if there's one thing that we always need to be remembering when we're looking at the Scripture is how does this relate to my life? What can I pull from this? How can I relate this uh, to what they are doing? to what's happening in my life. So are we giving the devil a foothold? So that's something that we always have to examine when we read through stories like this that we see them doing things and we need to think about our own lives. Uh, again, in this second dream, we're going to see how this is a prophetic statement that's coming. So we get up to uh, verse 12. And 12 through 36. And this kind of leads us into uh, Joseph going out to find the brothers in the field. 
He, Jacob had told him, hey, go check on your brothers, see what's up with them, how are they doing. He goes to look for them. He can't find them where they're supposed to be. And somebody nearby says, oh, no, wait a minute, they went on down to Dover. So he goes down that way. And obviously, uh, they see him coming. It may have been because of his coat standing out even, that they see him coming from a distance, and they know who it is. Now keep in mind, this is uh, the same guy that was known to go and rat out his brothers for wrong things they were doing. This is the same guy that was telling them they're going to worship him or bow down to him. Um, so you, you, you see that jealousy, you see that anger, that hatred, boiling in them, and then here they see him coming from a distance. So they begin to put a plan into action, and they, the motives, you begin to see the motives of their heart. You begin to see the things that are coming from their heart that causes this action. And in my line of work, in law enforcement, we would call that premeditated. They are doing a premeditated act. And in this case, we're looking at a premeditated act of human trafficking. Um, obviously, as the Bible reminds us, there's nothing new under the sun. And even today, as we, as I deal with, um, in my work, human trafficking, we see it here in the narrative in the Old Testament. Um, and let me give you a little sidebar informational here. As I always have to do when it involves something I deal with at work, on human trafficking. Uh, there's three types of trafficking. Labor, which could be like live-in maids, agricultural workers, traveling sales crews, or possibly even people that work in foreign restaurants. Uh, you also see sex trafficking. This could be through pornography or escort services. And then you also see sex and labor trafficking. This is workers uh, working off their transportation being brought to the country. And they do that by maybe working in nail salons, uh, maybe foreign restaurants, maybe massage parlors, health and beauty spas, uh, working in strip clubs, bars, things like that. For Joseph, we find him sold into labor trafficking. Um, so when we look at that, again, we need to think of questions of how this affects me. Um, and when we see the brothers basically coming up with this plan, we need to think about, okay, am I coveting things those around me have and giving the devil a foothold for me to commit premeditated acts of sin? Do I have things welling up inside of me that would create actions, sinful actions? Can I find ways that my greed, jealousy, or anger has become between me and God? So, we see this in them, forming this plan of what they're going to do to Joseph when he gets there. They wanted to kill him, but Reuben talks them out of it, recognizing how horrible this is. But he's also satisfying the brother's lust for pain to be caused to Joseph and not wanting to do wrong. Um, do we sometimes stand back and not confront other believers when we see them getting ready to do something really bad? Are we playing both sides of the fence? Pleasing the world, but then also trying not to be a part of it? Because I think Reuben maybe is kind of in that boat also, where he's not necessarily confronting them of sinful acts they're wanting to do. He's kind of, well, can we do this? And I'll come around and sneakily save him and You'll get your thirst of pain on Joseph, but then we, we won't really have the guilt of killing him behind us. So, greed plays a factor into this. So they're looking for the greed also, and they sold him to the Midianite traders, um, a people group from Abraham's wife, Keturah. When, uh, the way they describe it here, and uh, I'm thinking of these Midianite traders and their little herd of camels. And I'm thinking of the Jawas on Star Wars. How they were going through the desert 
looking for like androids to buy and things like it, looking for scrap metal. Uh, that's just, I mean, I'm sure that's where Star Wars got it from. Um, but that's just, that's the thought that comes to my mind. And here's old Joseph uh, in a sister. Now, if you're not familiar with a cistern, a cistern is just a big hole in the ground where oftentimes water would be stored or things be stored in it. Uh, usually anywhere from 6 to 10, 12 feet deep, something like that. Uh, growing up out in the country, we used to have cisterns or wells before we got city water. So, uh, you know, it's a pretty good hole you're stuck down in. So he's in there, here come the Midianites, or the Jaws, either way. Um, here they come, and they sell Joseph to them, basically trafficking him. Uh, they make, I think it was 20 pieces of silver off of him. So, looking at that, again, self-evaluating what, what's going on, um, This can show us an example of how God is sovereign and still everything goes through his hand and can be utilized to his glory. We're going to find out more about this later, but ultimately we're going to see God's sovereignty utilized in this. This is also an example of what can be done when bad things happen to us and we have nothing we can do to change our circumstances. We're going to find out again in the future how Joseph reacted to this. Now, obviously, Joseph did not deserve to be sold into labor traffic. He did not deserve to be sold to the traders and taken to Egypt. Um, but we're going to find out what his response was to that in future chapters. But remembering, everything goes through God's hand. Uh, we also look at, in verse 34, how Jacob begins to mourn when he begins to hear about, uh, yes, that's Joseph's coat, and he just, you know, he mourns his, his loss. We can also kind of relate that to, as a form of like idol worship. Um, something for us to consider, and when you look at Jacob's role in this, did Jacob really help Joseph when he openly loved him more than he did any of the rest of the kids. And basically, in a way, worshipped Joseph because he had came from Rebecca. So, again, looking at ourselves, what idols in our lives stand between us and our worship to God? Can we point out at least three things in my life that can easily stand between myself and God? You know, do I put my children on such a pedestal that it comes between me and worshiping God? Or do I put my job between me and God because I'm more concerned with how much money I earn so I can buy the next thing? Um, you know, during this time where with the coronavirus, a lot of people are really evaluating what's important in their lives right now. They're being forced to remove themselves from things that they were a part of. And I think some people are finding it refreshing to be reminded that this isn't your life. Um, you were put here for a different purpose. And sometimes we implement things going on in our community and we put them as idols between us and God. And I think that's something that, that we see here in what Jacob has done with Joseph. So, in this chapter, you know, Joseph starts a key figure in the Old Testament. There's a lot we can get from him that we will learn in the future. Um, you know, some struggles for us that we may find. We often look at Joseph's brothers or hear about something like human trafficking and we think about how sick some people are. Oh my gosh, how terrible this is. How can we re what kind of brothers would do that? And we have to be reminded that it is very easy 
for us to give the devil a foothold, for us to begin to do premeditated acts of sin, just like Joseph's brothers. We must constantly evaluate our lives to see the sinful desires we're not addressing. Because if not, it's very easy for us to come up with excuses to do some of the most horrible things also. Just like Joseph's brothers did to him. You know, God gives us examples on how to respond to these issues when we encounter them. In this section, in this chapter, I like to look at it this way. Am I Reuben? Am I playing both sides of the fence? Am I trying to please the world, but also trying to be nice or, or be a Christ follower? Which one am I doing? Or am I the brothers? Am I ate up with pride? Am I ate up with jealousy of what other people have around me? Am I ate up with greed? To where work and money and what I can obtain is the most important things in my life? Am I Jacob? Are there things that I put before God that I worship? Or am I Joseph? Who's a victim in this? But as we will see, still doing God's will. How am I going to respond when bad things happen to me? And we'll learn more about that, but we have a choice as to which character do you want to play in the story. And what can we address in it? So, with that, You'll have to wait for the future updates and the future chapters. Go ahead and close us out in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for your grace and your mercy again, Lord. Thank you for giving us, Lord, your word, the Bible, that we can just look at people in the Bible, Lord. We can look at our own lives. We can look at their faults and then see, Lord, how does it apply to my life? Where are the faults in my life? How can I react differently, Lord? How can I be more like you in all that I do? Lord, help us realize the things that come between us and serving you, Lord, wholeheartedly. Lord, be with us as we go through these trying times, Lord, that we minister the best way we can to those around us, Lord, and if nothing else, just being in constant prayer for each other as we do. Lord, in sweet name we pray. Amen.